Hi, friends. I've gotten a couple comments here recently that I want to share with you and a couple questions. So uh, a handful of you have written to me and said, hey, I'm in conversations. I'm doing what you encourage us to do. I'm sharing Jesus. And oh, by the way, anytime you're sharing Jesus, you're in a conversation with Jesus, you're helping someone think critically about important things and caring for what Jesus loves, you're winning. Like the kingdom of God is winning. You don't have to lead that person to Jesus. You don't have to, uh, if you will, win an argument or a conversation. Again, we don't really want to be in arguments. We want to be in conversations. But you don't have to walk away saying, hey, I got the victory. If you are engaging and you're growing, then that's a victory for the kingdom of God. But here's the question that I get. I hear some of you say that you're in those conversations and someone says, hey, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So when you talk about God, they say, well, extraordinary claims, God's existence requires extraordinary evidence. Or when you're talking about the resurrection, they say, I can't believe in that because an extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. Right? That is a kind of packaged social media phrase that skeptics use to uh, think that they've done a mic drop from Christianity uh, right there. Here's what you should respond with. What do you mean by extraordinary evidence? Now, most people haven't really thought through that because, one, it's not their own argument, and they haven't used it enough to make it their own argument. But here's the question. What does extraordinary evidence really mean? You see, I don't know. I can't really help you if you can't define what extraordinary evidence would be. If you present to me a definition of extraordinary evidence, then I would say, is that consistent with Everything else you believe, or does everything you believe require extraordinary evidence? When you go to get on a plane and you put your life in the hands of the pilot, do you require extraordinary evidence there? Or is it just in this one case because your presupposition against God, your predetermined set of beliefs that God can't exist or doesn't exist, exclude normal or, again, just evidence for God? because I don't believe there's anything as extraordinary or normal evidence. I believe there's just evidence that we have to put into the filter. We have to look at it, examine it, and go, this is believable or it is not believable. Let me give you a way to think about this. In a conversation the other day, someone said this to me, and I said, well, what would it take for you to believe that Abraham Lincoln was the 15th president? The person said, well, I, I already do. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, we have writings. We have we have paintings. And I said, so if we have paintings on something that is believable, they said, well, no, I guess we have paintings on things that aren't believable. I said, so what is it that is evidence? What What is acceptable in your worldview as evidence to prove a claim? And we walked through it. We talked through historical writings, eyewitness accounts, artifacts that were left by Lincoln and those around him. We have photographic evidence. We have detailed descriptions not just from his time, but after his time. So we have all these pieces of evidence that prove what, here's an individual who did extraordinary things, became president, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, in that sense, freed the slaves. That was pretty extraordinary. And we have normal evidence that we use to validate the claim that Abraham Lincoln was indeed our 16th president. And when we look at the case of Jesus Christ, we have all of those, but photographic evidence, which isn't fair to require of the first century, because why? Photographs didn't exist. In fact, wouldn't exist for over a thousand years. So we label and ask for claims that aren't consistent with how we evaluate all other claims. Now, you can say, well, that's because I, I'm asking God to do a claim. Richard Dawkins was in a debate, and if you don't know Richard Dawkins, he was kind of labeled one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse for the atheistic movement in the early 2000s. And he made this statement on the debate floor, and he said, you know, if you're going to make extraordinary claims, you have to offer extraordinary evidence. Well, I would argue that the resurrection and creation, existence of all things, uh, universal moral laws, objective right and wrong is pretty good extraordinary evidence for Jesus. But Richard Dawkins, I got to give him credit. As he was on the stage and the person he was speaking with said to him, well, Richard, if God appeared to you in a fire and a flame and came down from heaven with thunder and lightning, would you probably write that off as kind of a visionary delusional statement moment? 
He said, yeah, I probably would. I got to give him credit because at least he acknowledged that even if God did an extraordinary claim, that he wouldn't accept it. Most of our friends are the same way. They just don't want to believe in what is the evidence. In fact, many haven't taken the time to examine the evidence. So don't be rocked on your heels. Don't be taken aback. Don't think the conversation is over when someone says extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Simply ask, what do you mean by that? What would extraordinary evidence look like? Is that consistent with the rest of your beliefs? Let those questions guide you into a deeper conversation so that you can help someone think critically about important things and care for what Jesus loves. Thanks for the comments. Thanks for the question, guys. Keep the questions coming. I love hearing them.